please set yourself up. Please shut your laptops. If you still have your name tag tags, please bring them out. If you don't, make one for yourself. Yeah. Turn the screen off. That's okay. I mean, my the point of not having your laptop open is that you don't get distracted, right? Which is a tremendous. I, mean, I don't want you multi multitasking in my classroom. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can do it from outside. <laughs> I have nothing against you doing whatever you want to do, just not in my classroom, right? I kind of vaguely remember this. Me a favor, don't multitask. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. I don't want to be saying anything that sounds like I'm picking on a student, right? Yes. So apologies for that. Hmm. Hmm. All right, guys, let's begin. Again, laptop shot, name tags out. Thank you. Let's. Uh, my apologies for Monday. I was disoriented. I had been uh, teaching from 12 to 1.30, from 4 to 5.30, and then I was here at 8. So I think I had my days of the week mixed up. But anyway, uh, this is the last of the series of lectures on training. So can you shut your laptop? Thank you. And the attendance uh, poll, here's the Piazza post number 531. Please do uh, sign up. Now, here's a quick recap. Just to remind you of uh, what we've covered so far, we've seen that when we train a neural network, we actually want to minimize the overall divergence across the entire input space between the target and the computed functions, but what we actually do is to minimize the average divergence over a collection of uh, training points. And uh, this is what we call the loss. This is the empirical risk. And the loss, once you're given a collection of training points, is a function of only the network parameters. And so we end up uh, optimizing the network, ends up being a function minimization problem. We minimize this loss function through gradient descent. And we also saw that while in principle you want to minimize the loss, the actual loss, which is the average divergence over the entire training data, doing this iteratively is very expensive because this means that at each step you have to go through the entire training data. And so we found that if you do this incrementally instead, using things like stochastic gradient descent or mini batch descent, you get faster convergence. And the last bit where I kind of fouled up in the, in the last class was we sort of revisited trend algorithms. And trend algorithms end up being particularly important uh, in uh, when you perform online updates like stochastic gradient descent or mini batch. And that's because even with the same current set of model parameters, if you uh, compute the gradient over different batches, we know that each of the batches is going to have a different gradient because each of them is seeing a different divergence, right? D divergence function. And so one batch, each of your batches may all have different derivatives. And so as you go through the derivatives, if you had a batch, 
if you were going over the entire batch, even then you might find something noisy of this kind. But when you're going over mini batches, this thing tends to be noisier still because each batch is looking at a completely different derivative. And so this is where the trend algorithms become really important because maintaining what you really want to do is to compute an average over all of the batches. You're trying to tend towards what you would get with a full batch. And that's why we maintain a running average over all of the derivatives that we have computed over the many batches as, as we go through the iterations. And so this, uh, not doing this can be, uh, can have a really bad effect on convergence, in particular when, you're, when you've got uh, online updates like stochastic uh, gradient descent or mini batch descent. Now, we also said that mini batches were better than, uh, now what, why did we say the stochastic gradient descent or could be better than batch updates. Stochastic gradient descent, we said, was, was better in some sense. Why did we say that? Less variations. Less variations is not stochastic gradient descent, right? Which has the lower variance? You get a lot more updates, right? The uh, variance was going to be proportional to one over the size of the batch. So for the stochastic gradient descent, the variance is very large, which is why you're going to get a large swing in the derivatives from batch to batch, right? from instance to instance. In many batches, you'll have a lot lower swing, but you're still going to have a much greater swing from many batch to many batch than when you were performing batch updates. On the other hand, you know, while you're getting all of this noise in your derivatives, you get many more updates in a single pass through the data, and the trade-off tends to work in our favor, particularly if we've got uh, vector processing like GPUs. So that's where we left off. Now today, we're going to look at a few more issues like divergences, normalizations, and some regularizations, right? So first thing, uh, here, the very first thing we want to note is that what we are minimizing is a average divergence function. And so how well the algorithm is actually able to minimize the loss is going to depend on the loss function itself namely the divergence function, right? And divergence functions, depending on how you choose it, the, the divergence function is something that you choose. And if you choose the wrong one, you can get horrible uh, solutions. For example, if your divergence function was something like the figure to the left, which is not at all unlikely if you are just counting errors, then it's, it doesn't have any decent kind of shape. You cannot differentiate it, you cannot follow gradients, that's not something you want. Now I have two other divergence functions. One of them is smooth and the other is, both of them are smooth, but one of them is flat, far away from the minimum and very steep near the minimum. The other is the exact opposite. Which of these two would you think work better for you? Obviously the one to the right, right? Because what would happen is that on the figure to the left, when you're far away and you really want to get to the solution quickly, you're gonna take very small steps. When you get close to the solution, and you want to be careful, you're going to swing wildly and bounce out. The one to the right where you have a bowl shape is the kind of uh, divergence function that you really want. But then you can have some surprising conclusions when you begin actually chaining uh, functions. So for example, in a neural network, a neural network is actually a nested function. You can think of each layer of the network as one function, and the next function, which is the next layer, operates on the output of the previous layer. So it's a function applied on a function applied on a function, and this nesting can have strange effects, and we'll see an example of this. But first, some examples of standard divergences. Anytime you perform a regression, then we like to use the uh, L2 divergence, which is the half, half. We, we have the term half as a matter of convenience, because when you take derivatives, the two that comes down from the squaring cancels out the half, right? And so the uh, Euclidean, distance, or the L2 norm, uh, the L2 divergence is half of the squared Euclidean distance between the target value and the computed value. Then for classification, we said we like the KL divergence. And the KL divergence we, was given by this. It was summation uh, d log i di log di over yi, where y is the output of the network. And clearly when d equals y, d over y becomes one, 
so this is going to go to zero. And at pretty much any other value of y, this will always be positive. It's easy to demonstrate that. And this is the KL divergence. But then, over here, this first term doesn't depend on, depend on y. I can ignore it. And so when I ignore it, what remains is the cross entropy, which is what you normally minimize. Now, the thing to remember is that the cross entropy is not the KL divergence. The KL divergence has this extra first term. So the minimum of the cross entropy is not at zero or not necessarily at zero, unless your desired output is one hot, in which case all the d's are either zeros or ones. And in that case, the cross entropy and the KL divergence simply reduce to minus of the log of the uh, target uh, probability assigned to the target class, right? And obviously, uh, you, you want to maximize the probability assigned to the target class. All of this is fine. And so when we look at the derivatives, things become a little uh, interesting. Now, if I'm estimating probabilities, why should I use the KL divergence as opposed to the L2? Now, here is what the KL divergence and L2 divergence look like. Now, in the first case, uh, here I have, I'm, think, I'm considering a simple binary classification problem. The target probability is 0.5. That's what I want the output to be. So if you looked at the KL divergence, if the uh, network assigned zero probability to something that must be uh, probable 50% of the time, right, then the KL divergence becomes infinity. On the other hand, if something that's improbable 50% of the time is assigned certainty by the network, then to the KL divergence becomes infinity. Whereas if I look at the L2 between the output of the network and the target output, which is 0.5, it's a nice bowl shape. Now, based on what we just saw a few slides ago, which of these two is going to be the nicer function to optimize, or what we discussed in the last class? Pardon me? Yeah. The second one, right? That's what one would appear, it seems like, because when I have a function of this kind, clearly, out here, it's going to take giant steps. But then when you come here, it's going to become too slow. Whereas if I have a function of this kind, then behave, this behaves much more nicely. So this is what one would guess if one just looked at these pictures. But then here is a strange thing. This is where the nesting of functions comes back to bite you in the rear. And so if I have, if I consider my network, think of just the output layer, just the output neuron, right? And let's consider the simple, exa simple example where you're performing a simple binary classification task. And so in that case, you have the outputs, the, you have the affine value z, and this goes through your sigmoid, and then you have the output y, and then you have the target output d, and we are computing your KL divergence, right? And so what this figure is plotting is this guy. Or alternately, I could be looking at y. I could be looking at L2. And this would be my L2 divergence. So these two figures are plotting these two pictures, right? Now, in this case, if I look at the function as a, this is the, KL, the L2 divergence is a function of y. It looks like a nice bowl. The KL divergence is a function of y looks like this. But then if I take a step back and look at it as a function of z, what the value, the affine value before the activation, here's what it looks like. And now, which of them is the better divergence? Yeah. Clearly, right? And so that's, so the point is because we, we are progressively adding nonlinearities, what seems like a nicer loss function on the outside can end up becoming far more hideous as you go back into the network. And so it's very hard for us to predict the behavior of any given loss function. So this is for a single unidimensional case. This is the multidimensional case where you have, I'm actually looking at uh, it as a function of these two guys. So let's say I have x1 and x2. Then what does it look like as a function of x1 and x2? And you can see once again, you know, if I take a, so, so long as I'm going past a linear layer, for the L2 divergence, it looks like a flower, which is not what you want. 
for the KL divergence, it looks like a bowl. Does this mean that the KL divergence is a better loss function than the L2 divergence? At, for, the, for, for the output layer, yes, right? Because for the output layer, it means that when you go past the activation, the function remains convex, and so you can actually uh, do a better job of optimization. But then once you go further back, there's no saying what happens. That's going to depend on the activations and the depth of the network and everything else. But at least for the output layer, the KL divergence is clearly a better choice than L2, right? Questions? Yeah. So, but would it matter how much is behaving way back? Like, because we always calculate. What are you going to be minima optimizing? So we always find our divergence as an out after as an output, right? Yes, but what you really so again, you have some weights over here. And this is going through some activation, another activation, and finally you get out, get the uh, x2 out here. So what we want is the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy. Right. And so that is the shape you're really interested in, right? And that should ideally be a bowl, but we have no such guarantees. Questions? Uh, yeah. Will, will these differences uh, impact the pro uh, process of Propagation. Obviously, right? Because, I mean, think about this. If I just have these two, then if I had, for example, just a single input and a weight w, this, the derivative of the loss with respect to w looks like this guy if I'm using the L2 and this guy if I'm losing, using the KL, which is going to converge better? The KL, right? And so, yes, it will affect your convergence. Make sense? Okay, so questions? Yeah, um, so is this like an actual impossibility or is this like open ended in order to like have smooth uh, internal derivatives? There's, there's a lot of work that keeps going on, right? We don't encounter a lot of it because we just work with things that we're familiar with. But yes, figuring out what kind of loss function would actually get you to an optimum quicker and what kind of update rule is going to get you there quicker is very much still in uh, open area of research, <clears throat> right? Anyway, uh, the other thing we've already pointed out in a previous class that regardless if you're performing uh, regression with an L2 divergence or if you're performing classification with a KL divergence, regardless in both cases, the derivative of the divergence with respect to this affine term is simply going to be the error at the output of the network. We saw this, right? So, and so we're literally propagating the error backwards, which is why uh, we call this error back propagation. Now, I noted that nobody actually challenged me on this uh, over Piazza, but if anybody does, we'll post the proof. It's very simple, okay? Time's up. So who's Silver Seal? Who's Silver Seal? Silver Seal is absent, okay. Who's Purple Shark? I keep calling Purple Shark every single class for some reason, and Purple Shark is always absent. I gotta check the roster, maybe they'll drop the class. And who's Teal Turtle? Why is it that the majority of names I call out are absent, right? So teal turtle is absent. Who is mint hummingbird? Is there a mint hummingbird? Guys, you're not attending, right? Who is green llama? Nobody? Also absent. Fantastic. Who is gray falcon? Absent. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, thank you. What is the answer to the first question? 
at scale. At scale, okay. And give me another name. And who's Olive Zebra? Olive Zebra is absent. And who's Mint Bear? I'm here, sorry. Okay, what's the answer to the second question? I don't know why minus D. Thank you, right? Everybody uh, has these answers, okay? I love these names. They're completely wonky, right? <laughs> Who wants to be a mint zebra? You just got to be one, right? This is never going to happen to you again in your life. You might as well enjoy it. Uh, anyway, so what we have learned is that the choice of divergence affects the uh, convergence and therefore both the learned network and the results that you will get with it. Now, uh, there's another big problem that we deal with, and this has to do with covariate shifts. Now, there are different ways of explaining this that I have seen on the web, but the one that makes more sense to me is what I'm gonna present to you. Now, what is our assumption about the various mini batches that we use to, to, to update the network parameters? That they're statistically similar, right? Otherwise, you would be looking at completely different functions in each case. So if each of these colored patches represents one of your mini, mini batches, your assumption is that if you looked at their distributions, they're more or less the same. They're gonna lie on top of one another. In reality, they're not gonna be the same, right? They can be very far apart. So in this case, if I use one of these, you know, the data from one of these patches to optimize my network, is it going to actually be uh, relevant to the remaining patches? They're in completely different regions of the space, right? And so nonetheless, uh, we want to uh, optimize the network using all of these different groups of data. So what we would like to do is to somehow drag all of the data back so that they are statistically equivalent, and then you can use all of them to optimize the network. And you'd, be, you'd, you'd expect to see a greater degree of consistency in the parameters that you learn. The problem is you don't really know where each of them must be dragged, and so, here is the trick that we will perform. We are going to move all of them to be centered at zero and to have a standard variance. This is easy, right? If I have a collection of data, I can move it to center it to zero by simply subtracting the mean. I can standardize the variance simply by uh, dividing by the inverse of the standard deviation, right? Or dividing by the standard deviation. And then once it's centered, I can have a standard transform which moves everything to this whatever lo whichever location I think is optimal for that particular a data set which I have maybe computed as being uh, representative for the entire space. And so this is basically what we're going to do when we perform batch normalization. So there's a gold tiger Someone has the great fortune of being a golden tiger. And so whoever it is, Mr. or Ms. Gold Tiger, this answer is gonna be yours. Okay, do we have a gold tiger? That's a lost opportunity, right? <laughs> Clearly. Uh, so there's a blue zebra. Who's blue zebra? Come on, guys. Okay. There's a purple falcon. Who's purple falcon? Purple yeah. falcon. Okay, what's the answer? Mini batches. Batch norm accounts for the covariate shift between mini batches, right? Easy. Okay. So how do we do this? Batch normalization is actually applied individually at each neuron in your data. So typically we're gonna apply it there. Remember how within each neuron, first we compute an affine value, and then that affine value is transformed using an activation function. So batch normalization is applied, computed on these affine values shown by these highlighted yellow boxes. Now you could apply it at other places. This is where we typically do it, because the basic principle is what is important. And so here's what we are going to do. There's a two-step process. First. This batch norm operates over the entire batch of inputs. Now, if I think about this z value, this z, the, for any given input, the z is just a scalar, right? At a given neuron. 
But then if I look at a collection of inputs, a mini batch, then I'm going to have a bunch of different uh, Z values. So this guy is going to be a single scalar which is computed from all of your inputs. Now this Z, the first thing we're going to do is to move the Z such that the collection of Zs in a mini batch has zero mean, right? So if I have a mini batch, then I have a bunch of, for a mini batch, I'm going to have a bunch of Zs. These are all my mini batch. And from these Zs, I'm going to compute a mean, which is the average of all of the Zs. So if I looked at all of the Zs, maybe they have some scatter. I'm plotting it in two dimensions, but it's, just, it's actually just a scalar. They will have some mean, and then I'm going to move the entire mini batch to be, to be zero, zero mean, which means that this mean is going to be subtracted from each instance of Z, right? From every Z in the mini batch. So the first step you're going to be doing is computing the mini, the mean of the mini batch. Then you compute the variance of the mini batch, and then from each of the Z's, you're subtracting the mean, which means you're moving the entire mini batch to be centered at zero. And then you're dividing by the standard deviation, which means that you are normalizing the variance of the mini batch, right? And then subsequently, uh, that's going to give you something that is centered at the origin, right? But then you want to move this entire mini batch to some standard location and scale it by some standard value. So how do you do that? So let me call this u, let me call this z. u is what you get after you normalize it. Then after you normalize it, you're going to find the scaling factor, which makes it the same size as this guy. So you're going to multiply u by some gamma. What happened here? OK. You're going to be multiplying u by some gamma which scales it, and then you're going to move it here, so you're going to be adding some beta. This is the entire operation that you're performing, right? And so that's your mini-batch operation. And so uh, here is why, here's how you can think about it. There's a, there are two steps. First, you're centering it at origin. That's one box. And then having centered the entire mini-batch at origin, you're moving the mini-batch to a new location. That's the second box. And the second box, in fact, com consists of first scaling by some value gamma, and then adding some beta, right? Everybody with me? Right, yeah. Can you go over why we wanted to move for you now where's the origin somewhere else? Why are we adding beta? So uh, there are a couple of different ways of explaining, uh, looking at it, but uh, you can think of the actual statistical location of that instance as, of, of for that particular neuron as lying in some specific location. Okay. But there's a different way of thinking about it that beta is simply the affine shift, okay. right? And it's going to apply to the entire, uh, every data instance, yeah. No, I just want to go one step back and ask, what is the reason you're doing this? That's the picture here, right? That each mini batch is going to actually be, have a different statistic. Your principle is that all mini batches have the same statistic, but they will not. So you're going to shift the mini batches so that eventually they end up in a location where the same statistic, the same operations can be applied, right? So that's it. Questions about these operations? Yeah. So you're taking the mean of the Z across all the neurons or for the same neuron? This is just for one, a single neuron. This is being applied at, separately at each neuron, right? Now, so I mean, you can think of this as a vector operation where you're computing a different mean for each neuron. I'm just showing you, the, showing you the operation at a particular neuron. So each neuron will uh, move separately? Yeah, each neuron is going to have a, you know, it's going to move separately, right? You can think about it as the bias for each neuron. Each neuron is going to have a different bias. Now, think, so what are we doing when we add a bias to the affine term at any neuron? You're basically moving the entire data to the location of the bias, right? What we are doing over here is an additional scaling, but before that, we are standardizing the mini batch. So the real key operation is the standardization, where we are moving everything to origin, then scaling and uh, a bias is a standard operation, nothing fancy, right? Where's yeah. the value theta coming from? You're learning it, right? 
So because that's like a bias in your right? uh, transform. So now, this causes a bit of a problem. And what is that? Now, in your standard training, if I have a mini batch, I'm going to have right, each of these Zs is going to be being put through some compute through which you get some Y, and then from which you know you get a divergence. You can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to Y, and then so thereby you can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the Zs. And so for each of these instances, you can compute this term independently, right? You can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the z independently because each y is independently computed, right? And so you can just sum them up. And so you have a, the situation you have is that your loss is the average of the divergences at each instance. And so when I compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the, uh, to uh, any particular parameter, it's going to be the average of the derivative of the divergences for the individual instances. I can treat each instance independently. But when I perform a mini batch norm, can I do that? When I do a, perform a batch norm, can I do that? Yes or no? no. Why not? Uh, you were doing it for each. So, what happens is this. If I look at the y, right, each of the z's, the mini batch mean and variance come from the entire, all the z's, right? So if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to the z, in the first case, I could have just taken this straight path backwards. But now this z influences this y because it affects the mean and the variance of the mini batch, correct? And so as a result, although I'm just trying to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this one z, I have to consider the paths, the connections through all the instances in the mini batch. And so uh, the, a better way to write it is that my output y is a function of not just the current input x, but also the mean of the mini batch and the variance of the mini batch, right? And so what this means is that, you know, if I have a collection of instances in a mini batch, the way to think about it is that you have a collection of instances in a mini batch, you're operating jointly on all of them, and you're going to get a collection of outputs in the mini batch, right? And so these are the normalized instances, and all of them are going to be, in all of these Y's or, or all of these Z hats are going to be influenced by each Z. And so because it's a mini batch, the situation we have here is that if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to any z, z let's say z1 hat, this is z2, z2 hat, and so on. And then I, all of them are going to be influencing the divergence, but then each of these is also going to be influencing every other z hat. And so if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to, say, dz1, what is the formula going to be? I'm going to have to sum over the entire mini batch because every z is influenced, right? And then I'm going to have to say d dive over d z i hat or z j hat, right? times d z j hat over d z i. So this actually complicates the computation of the derivatives. That makes sense to everybody? Right, and so we're going to have to figure out how this modifies your computation. So now here again, if I want to draw the influences, here's what it looks like, right? These are all the z's in the mini batch. All of the z's in the mini batch influence the mean. All of the z's in the mini batch and the mean influence the variance, right? And the output z hat, in turn, or the output u here, this is the normalized centered one, is a function of the corresponding z and the mean and the variance, right? 
And then this normalized value is just put through the shift and scaling to get you the z hat. So if I'm going backwards and computing the derivatives, now when I'm coming back, when I'm computing the derivatives, I can expect that as I've come backwards, I've got the derivative of the loss with respect to z hat. So here's what we have, right? Uh, this was the collection, this was the forward operation that we saw when I'm performing uh, a uh, batch norm. I'd compute my affine value. This is the entire batch norm process. There are two steps. In the first step, I'm going to be normalizing by the mean and variance of the mini batch. In the second step, I'm going to be shifting this normalized value to z hat, right? If I'm going back, I can assume that in the process of back propagation, I've, I've already got the derivative of the loss with respect to z hat. So now, given this, uh, let's look at that's uh, Look at these operations, simple enough. I have the derivative of the loss with respect to zi hat, right? And then I have zi hat equals some gamma times u, ui plus beta. So gamma and beta are parameters, right? So what is d loss over d gamma from this guy? What's it going to be? Come on, guys. So this is dl over dz hat, right? Yes. Times dz hat by d gamma, which is ui. ui, right? And so, and what is the loss with respect to beta? Just dl by dz hat. Okay, this is dl over dz hat, right? So this is easy. And so now I can compute the derivatives with respect to these two parameters. I also need to compute the derivative with respect to the u going back. What is the derivative with respect to u? So then I can just say dl over dui is simply going to be dl over dzi hat times gamma, right? And so given this, I can compute the derivative with respect to the parameters, beta and gamma. I can also compute the derivative going back with respect to the u. So this, everybody clear with this? This is easy, right? Nothing particularly complicated. So I can assume that I have managed to compute the derivatives with respect to all of these u's for the entire mini batch without any complication. The real complication arises when I try to transfer the derivatives with respect to the u's back to compute the derivatives with respect to the z's. But before that, here's a poll. And who are the colorful characters who are gonna get called out? There's a coral woodpecker, beautiful. Okay, Coral Woodpecker, what's the answer to the first question? Coral Woodpecker, no, not present. Lime Turtle, who's Lime Turtle? Oh, here, the first yeah, one's the correct. Wait, pardon me? Uh, the first one, okay. um, all the other diseases. Thank you, and who's Apricot Panther? That's such a cool name, Apricot Panther. It's absent. Yeah, here. Oh, all right. So Apricot Panther, what's the answer to the second question? Uh, true. So oh, thank you, right? So in batch norm, the normalized value depends on all the other Zs, right? And uh, because every Z is going to be influencing the mean and the variance, and all of those in, in turn influence the use. And so when you're going backwards, you basically have to con consider the operations over all of these guys. This is basically a vector operation, except it's not a vector over a vector of inputs, it's a vector, the, the vector here is the mini batch. It's taking the entire mini batch, transforming the entire mini batch, and giving you the 
standardized mini batch. It's basically, move, basically moving the entire mini batch to the uh, to the uh, origin, right? And so here is the operation that we've got. I have all of the Z's, and then the Z's are all influencing the mean. The Z's and the mean are influencing the variance, and the Z's, means, and variances are influencing the views. I'm going to start off assuming that I already have the derivatives with respect to the U's. And so if I'm looking at the derivative with respect to any given ZI, that's going to be the sum over all of the U's or the derivative of the loss with respect to the U times the derivative of U with respect to the Z, right? So what are the terms we need to compute now? Anybody? The derivative. So now, but here, so this guy is what we need to, this is already computed, right? This is the term that we need to compute. Everybody with me? Right. So now, this is where drawing all of these influence diagrams is really going to simplify matters. If I asked you to compute this derivative and made you write formulae, you're going to find that you're going to run into, you're going to get tangled double quick. And so, we have to do this for every i, j pair, which means, I need to compute the derivative of this u with respect to every one of these z's, right? The straight line and the, uh, the diagonal lines, right? So let's try to co compute this. Let's take any particular uh, u and z. So let's say u1 and z1, right? What is the derivative of u1 with respect to z1? Now let's look at all the connections, right? There is, how many uh, edges are coming into U1? How many, how many? Three, right? Three, three edges connection, there are three arrows coming into U1, do you see that, right? So how many terms will you think, do you think will be summed when you compute the derivative of, uh, when you back propagate through U1? Three, right? So if I want, because if I'm looking at, the law, any Z1, eventually Z1 is going to connect to U1 through three arrows. So if I'm looking at the derivative of the loss with respect to U1, it must sum three terms, right? The first is this guy. So it's the direct derivative of U1 with respect to Z1, right? What's the second one? So the second is this guy, right? Which is going to be the derivative of U with respect to the mean times the derivative of the mean with respect to z1, right? What's the third? The third one here's this guy, right? There's a derivative of u with respect to sigma squared times the derivative of sigma squared with respect to u1. I've drawn the entire graph, but you really eventually only want to know what the derivative of this guy is with respect to this term. So everybody with me so far? Right, when I write down the formula, it's very simple. Once you begin drawing the pictures, it becomes very clear, right? So now, Let's go back and compute these individual terms. What is, here is what I've got. I have ui uh, ui equals what? zi minus the mean divided by sigma squared, this is the mean of the batch, right? Sigma squared plus epsilon. So what is the partial derivative of ui with respect to zi just going straight through? What would this be? Anyone? Hmm? Root over the sigma squared. Yeah, can, can you say that loud, please? One over the root of sigma squared. This is simply going to be one over, because you're not considering the influence of the means and the variances over here, right? This is just the straight through path. So if this is just the straight through path, the, second, the remaining terms are being considered constant, correct? So if I do that, this is going to be one over square root of sigma squared plus epsilon. Everybody with me over here? Right, doubts? No, okay. So this guy here is going to be this term, right? And so let me plug that into the formula here. Everyone here? Good with me? Okay. What is D, the derivative of 
u i with respect to the mean. Again, now only the mean is being perturbed, the z is being held constant, right? So what is the derivative of ui with respect to the mean? Negative of the same term. This is going to be minus 1 over square root of sigma squared plus epsilon. So everyone with me? Right, so this guy here is going to be minus 1 over uh, square root of sigma squared plus epsilon. And so I can drop that in here. Okay, what is the next term I want to compute? Let me pull up a name, right? So who is? Uh, well, somebody. What's the next term I want to compute? Mm -hmm. Speak up, guys. Mean by ZI. So the derivative of mean by mean over ZI, right? What is the derivative of mean with respect to ZI? Sorry. Derivative of the mean with respect to ZI. What is that? One over B. This is one over B. Mini batch size. Beautiful, right? So this. You can get it from that first highlighted formula. It's just 1 over b. I just plug it in. So look at how quickly we've managed to write our derivatives out once you actually draw the arrows and figure things out, right? Easy. So now what is the next term I want to compute? Anyone? This is, what is the next term I want to compute? Just going left to right. This is going to be the derivative of ui with respect to sigma squared. What is this? Which, which formula would you use over here? Remember, when I'm looking at the derivative of the mean with respect to ui with respect to sigma squared, you're assuming, assuming mean and z are not being perturbed, correct? So if the mean and z are not being perturbed, which formula am I going to use of the three? Third one, Third one right? And now what is the derivative of u with respect to sigma squared? Anyone? Come on, guys, you've all done calculus. Yes. So I'm saying u equals z minus mu times sigma squared plus epsilon raised to minus half. Is that correct? So now can you tell me what the derivative is? Minus u into sigma squared minus plus epsilon to the power minus three by two. This is sigma squared is going to be z minus mu times sigma squared plus epsilon raised to minus three over two, and there's a minus half. Right? Everybody with me here? So this is easy. I can actually plug that in, right? Straight here. Everyone with me here? What is the next term I must estimate? Okay, so you guys are with me. Why did I keep the Teresa? Why do these things travel here? They don't travel. They, they, have, they must be brightly colored. I can't see them. So now this is the derivative of what? Sigma squared with respect to ui, right? How many terms will this derivative have? Hmm? How many terms will this derivative have? How many arrows from u i are coming into sigma squared? Even derivative of sigma squared with respect to z. Z i, yeah, yeah, right. Z i. How many, how many terms will I be summing? Anybody? Two. Two. Two, correct, because there are how many arrows coming in? Two, Two arrows. And so what are these terms going to be? Can somebody tell me? Sigma squared by ZI and this is derivative of sigma squared over ZI. And sigma squared with respect to mu. Derivative of sigma squared with respect to mu, mu and is that it? Mu over mu. Is that complete? No, into mu by ZI. Everybody see how this happens, right? This is the, I've got this here, look at this guy. That's this graph, right? And it has two incoming edges. And so there are two paths here. 
this is the derivative of sigma squared with respect to z, then this is the derivative of sigma squared with respect to mu times the derivative of mu with respect to z. Everyone with me? Right. Now, what is the derivative of sigma squared with respect to z i? What is this term? Again, I must remind you that what is the derivative of sigma squared with respect to z i? Sigma squared with z i. Which formula will you be using? The second one. Second one. So now, can you tell me? Two over b times z minus mu b, right? That's simply going to be this guy, right? Everybody with me? Easy. So we, I can add that over here. What is the next term I must estimate? What is the derivative of the variance over the mean, right? So if I write that out, what is it going to be? So I want to have the derivative of the sigma squared over, the, over mu. And which formula will I use? Second one, and what is it going to be? Minus two over b. This is going to be minus two over b. Summation i, z i, minus mu. Correct? Everybody with me? What is this term? Is it mu? What is the average of the center data points? Zero, right? So this is going to be summation zi minus, right? So this is zero. This is simply going to be, I can write this as summation one, or leave it two over here. One over b summation i zi minus one over b summation i mu. This is going to be, you know, mu. And this is going to be mu. Cancels out, right? And so this second term, that's simply going to be zero if you work it out. Mm -hmm. And so then I don't need to even worry about the third term, right? Mm -hmm. And so the derivative of the variance with respect to z is simply going to be uh, 2 zi minus mu b over b, right? And so when I actually write the entire formula out, it looks hideous, but when you work it out, it wasn't at all hard to work out, was it? So long as you draw the picture out and you can follow the trail of all of the derivatives, the whole thing comes out to be very easily computed. Yeah? If you use it, if you're tracking the lines in the inference graph, uh, sigma b squared also has lines coming from z2, z3. But I'm only, I'm, I'm only interested in the derivative of sigma squared with respect to zi, right? I'm looking at, I'm computing a specific derivative, namely, what is the derivative of this ui with respect to the zi, that's it. Whereas if you want to look at the other terms, like the derivative of u2 with respect to z1, you would have to follow the same kind of arithmetic. Now you don't have the straight line anymore, right? But if you worked out the arithmetic, that's simply going to be, you know, the derivative of u2 with respect to mu times the derivative of mu with respect to sigma, and then the derivative of u2 with respect to sigma squared times the derivative of sigma squared with respect to zi. And if you expand it out, this is similar to i equals g without the first through term, it's just going to come out of this term here. I won't work out the arithmetic, but you know, if you did, you'd find this to hold. Everybody with me? Yeah. What happens when you are done and you just store the mean? Because maybe when you are doing inference, you only have one data point. So, but this is just speaking of back propagation at this point, right? We want the derivatives to update your model parameters. So, everybody with me so far, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, here is the uh, first first stage of batch norm, the derivative of u j. With respect to zi, if j equals i, it's this upper formula. If j is not equal to i, it's this lower formula. I won't go over the formulae, but the formulae have a significance in terms of interpretation, right? And the complete loss is the derivative of the loss with respect to any zi is the derivative of summation over all the u's of the derivative of the loss with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to zi, right? And so if I work it out, that comes out to be this kind of nasty looking formula but it's not nasty. You have to, if you just sort of work your way through it carefully, it's very easily derived, okay? Now, there's, I've shown you how to compute the formula. I'm not going to actually go over the formula, but the final formula 
tells us a little story. Every formula tells us a story, right? That's math. You just have to look hard enough and there's a story in there. And this has a story. It tells you something about how it expects mini batches to behave. Now consider this, if all of my data instances in the mini batch were identical, right? Then what would this value be? Let's look at it, right? So if I look at the derivative with respect to any zi, this is simply going to be, you know, d loss over dui, right? But if I look at the, the first term, if I look at the second term, if all of the inputs were identical, then all the u's are identical, right? So the d loss over du is going to be identical to all of them, for all of them. So what is the second term? What would the second term be? So the first term was simply uh, d loss over dui times something, right? And the second term is going to be 1 over something, the same x, times 1 over v, summation i, d loss over dui, right? But all of these are identical. So I can write this as v times d loss over dui, right? These will cancel out, and so these cancel out. The first two terms simply cancel each other out, right? What about the third term? What's that going to be? What is the third term? The third term is, again, if I simplify this, then I have the uh, 1 over b times zi minus mu b, right? And uh, sort of minus mu and over or square root of sigma squared, I'll leave that here. I'll suck this, then all the dl over du is going to be the same for all of them, so that comes out, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you have a summation over j, zi minus mu j, minus mu. What will this become? What is this guy here? Yeah. What is that term? zero, right? The sum of the centered points is going to be zero. So what does the third term become? Zero. Okay, so if all of the training data instances in the mini batch are identical, what happens to your derivative? Zero. Just goes back and becomes zero, right? If they're almost identical, what would you expect happening? It's going to be close to zero. So what is this telling us? You want diversity in your mini batch, right? Your mini batch should, you, you, if your mini batch, all the data instances in your mini batch begin looking very similar, you're going to get no derivatives at all. And then from that point on, back propagation is simply going to fail because there's nothing to be propagated backwards. So you want diversity in the mini batch. Make sense to everybody? Yeah. yeah. So here's a poor. Okay, who's Mint Falcon? It's your turn. Who's Mint Falcon? There is no I'm name. here. Okay, so what's the answer? Uh, I said true. True, thank you, right? Obvious. So, now, so everybody with me so far. What we've dealt with is back propagation, right? But what about inference? When you're performing inference, are you performing inferences over batches? or instances, instances, right? So what would the notion of a mini batch mean and a mini batch variance be during inference? You don't have any of that stuff. So you need some values for the mean and the variance to be stuck in. And so typically what we will do over here is that we're going to go back, once your training is done, you're gonna go over all of your mini batches and compute the mean of the mini batch means for all of the mini batches. And so also the variance, or the mean of the variances of all the mini batches over all the mini batches. 
And so we're going to actually use these guys over here, which is the average mean. I mean, is this making, making sense, what the average mean is? This is the average of the means of the many batches in your training data. And this is the average of the variances of the many batches in your training data. And these are the two terms that you'll actually use during inference. There's a denominator, the denominator is, you know, there's a B over B minus one, which is basically, uh, you know, trying to get an unbiased versus a biased estimator, but that's not as important as the basic idea itself, right? And so this is what we actually use to perform, to stand, normalize the data instances during entrance. Okay? Questions? Yeah. Is this like an additional parameter that we are saving for every neuron? Yeah, pretty much, right? And so batch norm, that's batch norm. And batch norm may be applied only to some layers or even some selected neurons in a layer. It improves both convergence rate and neural network performance. Uh, this is, uh, and uh, you need randomization of the training data. And we're gonna talk about dropout. It turns out that batch norm maybe may eliminate the need for dropout, okay? And these are some figures from uh, uh, EOF and uh, originally original paper. Here was a training that they performed, I think, on MNIST, maybe, where you have to, perf you know, the number of iterations is 30 million to get to some performance. But when they apply batch norm, uh, with different variations of batch norm, you get the same performance or better in like a fraction of the number of iterations. So it makes a difference. Anyway, the story so far, covariate shift between training and test may cause problems and can be handled by batch normalization. But then, all of this was sort of predicated on the idea that if I learn my function to minimize the error at my training points, it's going to learn the function everywhere. Does that really hold? This is what we had. We are trying to learn this grid but from these red dots, right? If I want to draw the one-dimensional one equivalent of it, and you're, and you're minimizing the error at just those training instances, right? And hoping that the network you learn is going to model the function everywhere. But this, if, here's the one-dimensional equivalent. There's absolutely nothing stopping my function, my network from learning the red curve when what I really want is the blue curve, right? How do you prevent this? We have no control because you don't really see anything in the blue regions, right, where outside the training, the training points. And so this is something we would like to avoid. We need an additional smoothing constraint that will fill in the missing regions in a somewhat reasonable kind of way uh, for generalization. And so I'm gonna be using a very simple example to show illustration to show how this works. I'm assuming that you have a network of sigmoid activations, but the principle applies to all activations, okay? But it's kind of easy to explain when I have sigmoid activation. So if I have a network of this kind, right? And then, let's say I'm trying to learn a classifier for the blue and the red dots. The function that I really want to learn is shown by the curve, right? But we know that the neural network is a universal approximator. There's nothing stopping me from learning this ugly function instead. So how, and do, you, do we want the purple function? No, right, we want the smooth curve. But the purple function is not only very likely, I mean, not only possible, it's very likely if you do not apply constraints. And why is that the case? It turns, and this is because if you look at the individual neurons, right, the individual neurons are capable of learning these very sharp rises and falls. If you look at this function that I just drew, the purple curve is just taking a 90 degree step and going up, then taking a 90 degree step and going, coming back down. It's very steep. And this kind of function can only be learned if each of the neurons is capable of capturing this kind of steepness. So let's look at a sigmoid activation. A sigmoid activation is shown by these curves. Now a sigmoid activation has this form, which is, If I, have just, if I have just one input, x, let's say, I'm going to apply the, put a weight, and then I get a sigmoid, then it's going to be one over one plus e raised to minus w times x, right? And so if I look at the sigmoid, if w equals infinity, what does this look like? Whenever x is positive, this is going to be 
one, right? When x, whenever x is negative, it's gonna be zero. So for w equals infinity, it actually gives me a very, very, very steep price, right? If w is zero, what do I get? The value is always one, right? So, and for other values of zero, how fast the function rises depends on w. The larger w is, the faster the function rises, right? If I do not want to permit something of this kind, what do I need to do? I want to put a restriction on w. I want to say, use the smallest w you can use to get away, get away that you can get away with, by also giving me zero error. And that ensures that the function doesn't rise arbitrarily steeply, and that it's smooth enough that I can actually get to my, uh, to the smoother function that I'm looking for, right? And so steep changes that enable overfitted responses are facilitated by large W. You want to constrain the W to be low, and this will force lower perceptrons and smoother output responses, which is more likely to give you the function that you want. How do you force W to be small? Forcing W to be small means that you're going to have to do something in your optimization itself. Now your standard optimization has this loss, which is the average divergence over all of the training instances. I have one over T written, which is just the entire training data, but the T would be the batch size, right? And your conventional training is going to minimize this loss which is the average divergence over all of the training instances. But now, we are going to say do not, it's, it's not sufficient to merely minimize my training loss. At the same time, also ensure that my weights are small. So to my loss, I'm going to be adding the squared norm of all of my weights. And so this means that I not only minimize loss, uh, minimize the average divergence, I also minimize the, uh, the weights, and the importance of minimizing the weights is controlled by this parameter lambda, right? And now the gradient descent rules are still, still say the same. So the gradient descent rules are, say that now I must minimize this modified loss, which is the sum of the average divergence and the squared norm of the weights, right? And if I do that, if I work it out, that's going to be, this is my modified loss, the, square, the average divergence plus the plus lambda over two times the squared norm of the weights. The one over two is just for convenience, right? And if I take the derivative, this is simply going to be the conventional derivative, the conventional gradient, plus lambda times the current value of the weights. Right, so earlier, you had this derivative. The update rule was something like this. Before you tried smoothing your weights, earlier you said any weight is going to become weight minus eta times, I'll just call this d over dw, which is the average divergence. And now, this is going to change to plus lambda times w. Does this make sense? Right, which I can write this as, I can move this guy out here, and I can say this is going to be one minus eta lambda, times w minus eta times d, d loss over dw, right? So this is your usual derivative rule, except that the weight is now being multiplied by some one minus, I call that eta lambda, but I can just call it a single term, right? Uh, it doesn't really matter. So what does this look like? Earlier, what you were saying is that each step, you just made an adjustment to the weight, right? Now we are saying that before you make an adjustment to the weight, shrink it a little bit. Does that sound familiar to you guys? What did you call it in your homeworks? Mm -hmm. Weight decay, right? You are shrinking your weights before you make your gradient-based adjustment. What is that actually doing? It is trying to, to encourage weights that are smaller in value. Make sense? Right, okay. And so that's your weight decay formula, right? There's another way of going about it. So, you know, the only thing that changed in your standard gradient update rule was that now you're multiplying your weights by some scaling factor, okay. 
Now there's another way of doing it, which is through the network itself. Now, in a network, each layer operates on the output of the previous layer, right? So if each layer allows the net the output input to change steeply, the next layer. So think about the network as a as a as a slope as a function with a slope. If each so if I have some input x, each layer has a maximum slope, say s i, right? So let's say the maximum slope of the layer, uh, Lth layer is SL, then any input is going to become S1, X times S1 times S2 times S3 times S4. So this is how each layer is going to scale your input in the worst case, right? Now if you are applying any constraints on the, each of the layers to make to constrain the slopes, so let's say all the slopes are less than one, then what's going to happen? it's going to get flatter and flatter. Whereas if these are allowed to be greater than one, it's going to get steeper and steeper, right? Typically, we put some constraints on the weights. What does this mean? It means the more layers you have, the less you're allowing the NEF function to be arbitrarily steep, right? And so another way of just uh, smoothing your function is to simply have more layers, right? And so, Here's a nice example. Those two pictures to the left are showing some decision boundaries that I tried to model using a network whose with the optimal architecture for these models. You know, I, can, I just need one, net, one uh, perceptron for each line, right? And you want the output to be one in the white regions and zero in the black regions. When I try to learn these using 10,000 samples from these data, the actual decision boundary that you learn is this hideous stuff to the right. So with a, this is unconstrained, right? And now here, uh, so, but then let's see what happens if I just take the same number of parameters and change the architecture of the network. So here to the left, I'm trying to model this, this hexagonal boundary with the diamond inside. And in each case, I've used 660 neurons. In the first case, I've arranged it as three layers of 220 neurons. In the second case, it's four layers of 115. The third, the third case, it's six layers of 110 neurons. The fourth is 11 layers of 60 neurons, right? And what are we seeing about the decision boundary that it has learned? The same number of neurons. As I arrange it as a, in, in depth rather than width, it actually learns smoother and smoother functions, which will generalize better for this particular example, right? Another way, of course, is to just throw in lots and lots of training data. But you get implicit smoothing by adding depth to the network, which is why deeper networks often generalize better, right? Now, it doesn't mean that they will always generalize better because the smoothness that you get may not be what you want. But, uh, you know, there's a general principle over here, right? Questions? Data, is, okay, so the final thing is data under specification can result from overfitted models and must be handled by regularization and more constraint, generally deeper network architectures. Any questions? Okay, guys, I'm going to maybe go five minutes over. You'll have to bear with me because of this last topic, which I would like to uh, cover. So the most important regularization technique ever has been dropout. And so what is dropout? To understand dropout, first you have to understand this notion of bagging. So this is a very well-known machine learning technique. How many of you have heard about it? So what is bagging? <laughs> okay, what is bagging? Uh, bagging is when you take different, uh, you don't take the entire training data that's available to you, you just take some percentage of it in the training model, and then next time you take a different percentage of it and uh, train it. So here's what we do in bagging. You're going to train many different classifiers. And then you're going to average these classifiers. Very simple. And the way, how, how do you train different classifiers from the same training data? You, the typical techniques is you sample your training data. And so different sub, subsets of the training data will give you different classifiers. Then you average a lot of them, right? But there may be other methods. So, and this has been demonstrated very often to be much, much better than simply training a single classifier from all of your data because you get this benefit of averaging many classifiers. So we're gonna do the same thing. Now, think about this. Suppose this is my network, right? During processing, during training, 
at each input, I'm going to switch the neuron off by tossing a coin, where the coin has a probability alpha of staying on and one minus alpha of turning off. So this is random, right? Which means that for any given input x1, the actual network I may see might be this one, which means that all of these black neurons have been turned off. Now this is going to be done differently for each input, which means that x1 may see one particular network, x2 sees a different network, x3 sees a completely different network, and so on. And in fact, it's done afresh each time, which means that after you're done with one epoch, if you go back and revisit x1, x1 might see yet another network, right? And so this is what we are going to actually use for training. And so here are the effective networks being seen by uh, each of the inputs, right? And so what is going on over here? If I have a network with n neurons, if I'm switching off neurons randomly, forget about output layer, you're not gonna switch off output layer neurons. How many different such networks can I construct from a network of n neurons? Anyone? Two raised to n, right? Each neuron can be retained or it can be switched off, right? And so this is basically uh, like saying that for a network of n neurons, there are two raised to n possible networks by choosing different subsets of nodes. And what we do when we see switch these neurons on and off, which is what we call, which is what dropout is, is you're basically, it's like saying I have this two raised to, this large collection of two raised to n classifiers. And for each training instance, I'm sampling one of these classifiers. So it's like bagging over a very large collection of networks, except that these networks share parameters because if an edge is, used by two different networks, they're gonna share those parameters. So dropout is like bagging over a large collection of shared parameter networks, and so uh, you get the benefit nominally of actually uh, get it, uh, of having this voting, right? But there's also a second interpretation of this business of dropout. Now, consider this network over here. This first layer is very dense, right? Now there's nothing stopping my network from simply learning a pass-through connection in that layer and, for, and not using the remaining weights at all. So in which case, although I have put in all of these parameters, the network simply learned this direct connection and the effective network was one layer less because it just you know failed to utilize all of these parameters properly. But when I use dropout, then every now and then, this neuron is not going to see this input. It's going to be forced to use the remaining neurons to make its prediction. And so you're forcing denser weights. You're increasing the uh, density of the parameter of the, of the features that each of the neurons sees. And once again, this will improve generalization, right? So that makes sense to everybody? Okay, so how does this work? You would actually have a coin at each neuron. In the forward pass, you're going to toss the coin at, at each neuron and learn, learn a mask. A mask is either a one or a zero. If it's a zero, then that neuron is not being forwarded on. If it's a one, it's being forwarded on, right? And the mask, mask can simply multiply your y's and then everything works just as, as usual, right? And in the backward pass, you, you have the mask from the forward pass. So when you're computing your derivatives backwards, when you compute the derivatives coming backward at each neuron, you're going to multiply it by the mask. If that neuron has been switched off, there's no further information being passed off, passed backwards. If that neuron has been used, then those derivatives will continue to get back propagated. So implementation-wise, wise, it's very simple, okay? Now, so this is all very good. This was what happens when you are performing your training. What about during inference? During inference, what do you want to do? If you're performing bagging, what is the correct way of doing performing bagging over here? For each instance, once again, you're going to have to sample a very large number of classifiers from your collection, right? And then you're gonna to have to process your data through this entire collection and then take an average. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, but you know, in terms of implementation, would that be efficient? That's gonna be horrible, right? So here we will make an approximation. And the approximation is this. 
what we really want to do is to compute what, what is averaging. Averaging is taking an expectation, right? So we want to perform an expectation over all the networks where the network itself is a function of all of the neurons in the network, right? Everybody with me? Now this, we will make a horrible approximation. An expectation of a function, is it the same as the function of an expectation? Meaning, if I take the uh, computer function on a random variable and take the average over the input space, is it going to be the same as simply computing the function at the average of the average input value? No, right? But we're going to make that approximation. We're going to say this is the same as the network of the expectation of y1, expectation of y2, and so on. We're going to make this approximation. But once you make this approximation, then this becomes feasible, right? Is this making sense? Right? Kind of? Yeah. Okay. Well, operationally, it must make sense. Okay, again, spare me the five minutes, guys. I just want to finish this topic, right? And so this means that I need to compute this term, which is the expectation of y. But what is y? y is the output of a network, which is multiplied by a Bernoulli parameter d, which is the coin flip, right? So the expectation of y is simply going to be the activation times the expectation of D itself, which is simply the probability of success for the Bernoulli parameter, right? And so during inference, all we need to do is that at each neuron, you're going to use the entire network, and then you're going to be multiplying the output of that, you know, each neuron by the dropout parameter that you use during training. Does that make sense? There are a couple of different ways of implementing this. You can either explicitly multiply these terms by alpha, or you can move things around and just pre-multiply all the weights by alpha so you don't have to remember to multiply the activations by alpha. Or you can do something even uh, stranger. You can pre-multiply all the activations by the inverse of alpha during training and not do anything during, the, during inference. But all of these are strictly equivalent, right? The basic principle makes sense, right? Okay. So. Uh, all that means is that, you know, if you're using dropout during inference, the output of each activation is being multiplied by this alpha term. And how does that work? This is from Nitish Srivastava, 2013. And they show how for uh, this particular, their experiment, the first paper on it, right? Uh, without dropout, the network actually saturates to some horrible performance. But the moment they add dropout, the performance actually gets improves dramatically. And this is because you get better generalization from the bagging effect. You also learn more dense and more useful features from the data, right? So there have been various variants on dropout, something called zone out, drop connect, where you drop individual connections as opposed to the entire neurons, shake out, white out, I know, various other things. But the basic principle still kind of is the same. So the story so far, I'm gonna add one bit. Dropout is a stochastic data or model erasure method that sometimes forces the network to learn more robust models. And then dropout and batch norm don't work well together because batch, you're, you're adding stochasticity to batch norm, but batch norm is not is itself a statistical method, right? So the interactions may be bad. Now we have a bunch of other heuristics. Your loss function may have very steep edges. If your loss function has a very steep uh, surface, then the derivatives are going to be very large, and then any gradient descent is going to is likely to overshoot and have nasty behavior. So, you know, uh, yeah, I showed you an example of where the where you had very steep wells. If you use the derivative of the well itself directly in gradient descent, you can end up in bad places. So, uh, we have things like you know, gradient clipping. If the derivative is too too large, the magnitude of the derivative is too large cap it, right? Or you have other things like your training data are always gonna be insufficient no matter how much training data you have. <coughs> but then we know that our data instances, we get labeled data instances, 
we can create synthetic label data from it by simply perturbing our training data. In the case of images, you can get perturbations by simply rotating, flipping, adding a little bit of noise distortion. You can do the same thing with other kinds of data as well, right? This is a common technique called data augmentation. And there are other tricks, like normalizing the entire training data to make it zero mean, which is like having a batch norm on the input. And uh, how you initialize the network when you begin training ends up being very critical. So there's a lot of work on optimal initialization of networks, some of which you will encounter in your homeworks and recitations, uh, things that you can look out for. Uh, eventually, although we've seen a lot of how training works and the principles behind many of the things that we use, there's no guarantee that hey, there's any particular combination that's best. And so eventually, it's an, training neural networks is an empirical art. You have to practice it to figure out how, you know, how to make it work. So I'll stop here. Thanks for waiting the extra three minutes. I'll be here for a couple of minutes to take any questions, but otherwise, see you next week. Again, it's stochastic, right? In general, it's not empirically we find they don't work together. Patch norm is a layer. You will always use it. You can't just get rid of it, right? I mean, you can have patch norm in some layers.